This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Hi, uh, welcome to uh, Unsiloed. My name is Greg LeBlanc, and uh, and we're here to explore all sorts of interdisciplinary thinking, interdisciplinary research. And today, uh, I'm really excited to host uh, uh, William Quinn, who is uh, an economic and financial historian. He's at uh, Queen's University in Belfast, and he's the co-author of this book, uh, Boom and Bust, about the history of financial bubbles. So welcome, William. So, hey, thanks for having me. Yeah. So, um, you know, economic history, financial history in particular is, is one of those things that, um, you know, it sits between a couple different departments. And, uh, and I think we, we were talking about how, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's hard to know which, which camp you really fit in because financial historians and economic historians don't really have a camp of their own. And I was wondering kind of what, what attracted you to, to this topic? Why did you get interested in it? And, um, and you know, when I look and try to figure out why people are interested in this, it tends to be very cyclical. I mean, I remember after the financial crisis of uh, 2008, all of a sudden everybody was interested in financial history. I remember after the dot-com crash, everybody was interested in financial history. And then when, when, when it looks like history is not repeating itself, then all of a sudden everybody's kind of no longer interested in history and they think that they're in this unique moment. So, so, uh, so I was wondering, you know, why did you get interested in this? Is, were you driven by some kind of, uh, of, of, of crisis or crash that, 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 uh, inspired things? Maybe you, you yourself lost a few dollars here and there in, in one of these crises or crashes? No, well, thankfully I'm not really old enough. Uh, I had no money whenever the financial crisis, uh, struck because I was, uh, just graduating high school and, um, the first degree in 2008, the first degree which I worked on was chemical engineering. Um, and, and I hated it. This was 2008, 2009. So just as the severity of the financial crisis was becoming clear. And while I was hating um, chemical engineering, uh, I also discovered that I'm quite interested in economics. Uh, so um, I got in touch with the university and said, starting from 2009, and can I change degree? And um, I, basically economics was full, uh, but there was a degree in economics and economic history, mm. which actually suited me a lot better because uh, history was one of my best subjects in high school. And I really wanted a subject where I could um, keep the qu quantitative skills, um, but also start to write because while I was in chemical engineering, I missed writing. Um, so my undergraduate degree then, this was the University of Manchester, England, um, was in economics and economic history. And uh, I graduated and came back home for, to Belfast. And as a remarkable stroke of luck, uh, Queen's University, Belfast, um, the main university in Northern Ireland, uh, had a booming economic history department. And I got in touch with them and got onto the master's program uh, in finance which sort of um, shifted me towards financial history more um, because it was run by my co-author on the book, John Turner. Um, so I went on to the master's and I did my PhD with John. And um, when the PhD was coming to an end, he said, interested in working on uh, this book with me, this History of Financial Bubbles. And yeah, I didn't really have to think twice about it. Well, I, you know, a lot of people come to economic history from more of a technical side and others come from more of a humanistic side. And in fact, in economics, you have a lot of people coming, you know, with a very scientific background. And, um, you know, sometimes people accuse economists of having physics envy, right? And, uh, you know, wanting to develop mathematical models that, that are as accurate uh, in describing human behavior as they are in describing the behavior of physical objects. And they're, they're, they're often very, very frustrated. I mean, I, I, I started in, I, started in astrophysics and moved over and, and, um, unfortunately people are kind of, um, kind of frustrating like that, right? When you try to find these, these general rules, I, I think in, in your book, you tried to come up with some kind of general principles about why and when, uh, financial bubbles, uh, occur. Could, do, do you, do you feel comfortable with your, with your model? Could you, could you articulate it for us? What, what are some of the, the, if you're, if you're trying to predict, uh, you know, when and where a bubble is going to happen, what would you look to? Uh, so, well, predicting bubbles is very hard. Um, 
uh, obviously this is what everyone wants to know is like when is the next bubble going to um uh, when is when is it going to arrive when is it going to crash um wh where should i put my money in uh right before it starts to rise um that's something's uh, obviously very difficult um but we what we really looked at first of all was what caused bubbles in the past and um in the book we go through really 10 episodes or 10 um, eras because there were some eras when there were multiple bubbles happening at once so um say japan in the 1980s you had land bubbles uh, and stock bubbles at the same time um and we came up with this model uh, which we called the bubble triangle and this is uh Basically, similar to the fire triangle in chemistry. Um, so, so did you learn the fire triangle in chemistry? <laughs> no, I, I tried to avoid chemistry at all costs. <laughs> okay. Um, so the fire triangle is something we're taught in school is that uh, you have three necessary conditions for a fire. There's uh, oxygen, heat, and fuel. And uh, once you have those three necessary condi conditions, all you need is a spark. And whenever you have a spark, you have a fire. Um, so we decided to translate this to what we call the bubble triangle. Um, and it's, so it's also got three sides. So uh, the first side is uh, what we call marketability, um, which is a little bit similar to liquidity. So how easy are assets to buy and sell? Um, this is multidimensional. So... Uh, it could be uh, what are the laws uh, surrounding how easy it is to buy and sell this asset? Um, how divisible is it? Can you um, package it up and sell it in small quantities? Um, what are the transaction costs involved? Uh, what are the legal costs involved? Does anything have to physically change hands in order to buy it? And what we find is that the more marketable an asset is, the less work you have to do to buy and sell an asset, the more likely it is to experience a bubble. And you might think uh, of historical examples already of where bubbles are preceded by these sudden increases in marketability. So, for example, right before the dot-com bubble, you had the internet making it much easier to buy and sell stocks at home. Uh, with the housing bubble in the 2000s, you had mortgage-backed securities. You're turning these um, mortgages uh, on the asset side of a bank's balance sheet that it can't simply buy and sell and using financial engineering to repackage these mortgages into something that can be bought and sold. That's an example of an increase in marketability. Yeah, the one uh, I didn't know about was the, the token in, in Japan, which was, uh, uh, you know, a sudden shift in in the marketability of, of equities right yeah um and you had some several other um restrictions being removed so it became much e easier for foreigners to buy and sell equities in japan um you started to get uh, this enormous growth in the uh, market for futures um which is very good for speculating um i wonder what we see right now in in you know, with the rise of Robin Hood and these uh, fractional shares, um, you, know, you can buy $5 worth of Netflix. You can buy $5 worth of, of Tesla. Um, now, it's not a huge difference. I mean, you could always buy, you know, a single share. But but now that you can buy things in, in such tiny quantities, I wonder if this this is, is creating a bit of a spark as well. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, um, even just this year we've seen, or last year now, uh, we've seen the these the, quite significant increase in marketability. Um, so an app like Robin Hood, you know, this is why we say marketability and not liquidity right. because it's there are more dimensions to it. So an app like Robin Hood, it's not just that it's easy to buy and sell assets uh, on Robin Hood, it's that it's fun. It's that it's, it's right there and it's in your pocket yeah. at all times. And you can buy any, any quantity, no matter how small. Uh, I, I, th I think that's very significant. Um, but of course, high marketability is only necessary. Um, it, it's just one of the conditions we have. Um, yeah, what's interesting so, about this, so, this this concept of marketability you mentioned, I mean, this could be applied to you know, the 
retail market or the wholesale market, right? Um, I think for a lot of people, when they look at behavioral economics, they, they tend to think, um, you know, it's all about stupid people, right? And, uh, and I think you know, Larry Summers famously said, you know, there's lots of stupid people look around. Um, but, but I think what, what, what one of the messages in your book is that, that the bubbles aren't uh, necessarily caused by uh, a, a lack of sophistication. I mean, there's one, you know, one element of it is, is when you have new investors and kind of unsophisticated investors kind of getting into the market. But, but there, there are plenty of situations where, where that's not the case, right? Definitely. Yeah. So um, I, I, we, we, when we look at historical bubbles, so what, one of the reasons for looking at historical bubbles is that you sometimes have data that you don't get from modern bubbles. Um, and when we looked at the British bicycle mania, which is a chapter in the book, uh, you have a record of who all the shareholders were in several companies, so you can see who's holding at different times. And what we find is that uh, the types of investor who um, invest in these basically bubble companies, companies that are sort of rising and falling um, in that sort of typical boom-bust pattern. The investors in these companies aren't inexperienced investors. They're not the types of investors you would think don't know what they're doing. They're investors who like risk. They're investors who are associated with buying um, mining shares, these high volatility assets. Mm-hmm. Um, so, it, yeah, it, it's not a case that people don't know what they're doing. I'm sure some people don't know what they're doing when they buy bubble assets, but it's more often a case of um, you know, doing it for fun for the same reasons that you might bet on sport or bet, bet on Las Vegas. Some people enjoy betting on stocks. I think that's the more significant um, driver in, in a uh, behavioral sense than um, naivety or inexperience. I mean, one of the things about I liked about your book was that uh, you know I've I've been studying these things for for over twenty years and 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 you know there's so much uh, new material in here. For instance, the the bicycle bubble I, I hadn't really known uh, known a whole lot about it, and so I was wondering why did you pick the ones that you did? Um, the, one of the mo- more famous, um, one of the most conspicuous uh, omissions in your book is the famous uh, tulip bubble, and and you talked about why you you know you left that one out and uh, and yet included the. Uh, um, kind of the, the emerging market, uh, you know, railroad bubble and, and, the, and the bicycle bubble and, and a couple others that are much lesser known. Yeah, so the, well, the, the short reason is that um, we left out the commodity bubbles. Um, so uh, if you, you compare a bubble in tulips um, to a bubble in housing or a bubble in stocks, the economic significance is just not comparable at all. Um, a, a bubble in tulips is a bit like a bubble in comic books or baseball mm-hmm. cards or Beanie Babies. Um, it's interesting uh, as a uh, as a human phenomena, but as financial economists, that's not really what we're um, trying to get at. And we want the bubbles that have. Um, either serious economic consequences or you'd expect them to have serious economic consequences. And if they don't, then that's telling you something interesting about uh, what types of bubbles are more destructive. Um, the Tulip Mania, I mean, the best book on the Tulip Mania is by uh, Anne Goldgar. Uh, she's sort of summarized the Tulip Mania and um, I think tulips became objects of speculation. So people did start buying tulips because the price was going up and that there was a bit of a bit of gambling going on with tulip bulbs. But a lot of what's been said about it is just uh, not true. It's sort of derived from these articles that were written as satire, mm-hmm. uh, but through the ages have been misinterpreted and mistranslated and started to be presented as though they were fact. And um, really, I, I just don't think the tulip mania was uh, significant enough to warrant inclusion in, in a book about financial bubbles, uh, as I say, and their uh, economic significance. Yeah, but uh, speaking of satire, I mean, you do have some some fantastic examples. I mean, one of the ones that I really liked was this one, you know, the company for carrying on undertaking of great advantage, but nobody knows 
what it is. <laughs> and this is from, from the 1700s. And, and, you know, this reminded me of, um, there was an ICO uh, back in 2018, I think, and it was called the, the, the useless token. And, and if you looked at the prospectus, the, the promoters said uh, that they just wanted to get a Lambo. That was the whole purpose of the, the token was to, and they, they raised, I don't know, a half a million dollars or something. It was, it was, it was pretty, pretty remarkable. A couple others that you point to is this, the, the Republic of, of Poirier, I think was, was, was one. And, and then, uh, what was the other one? The, the Gamuchkin Railroad. And, and uh, my, my other favorite one was the Aeronautical Swine Shearing Lunarian Joint Stock uh, Company, the Lunarian Ass. <laughs> uh, where, do, where do you find this? This is fantastic. I mean, are, are, these, are, these are great anecdotes, but they, they, they do sort of say something about kind of uh, what, what, what people are, are potentially capable of. Yeah, definitely. I, I think um, so. So the, these conditions that we talk about, that this sort of um, it's high marketability, um, people have lots of money to invest. There's a lot of speculation going on. Uh, these apply to genuine assets or houses. They're a real asset, but you can speculate in them. Um, but they also make it easier for uh, total fraudsters. Uh, so, I mean, it, it's no coincidence that Charles Ponzi uh, was able to f find so many investors for his scheme during the Florida housing bubble. Yeah. Um, and Bernie same, Madoff, of course. Of course, yeah. Uh, Enron during the, the dot-com bubble. The, these are um, the, these are much more common at the same time as you're getting bubbles. It's the, so the same instinct of um, buy, buying an asset because its price is going up that, that allows these to succeed. Um, I have some great uh, ICOs. Uh, there's a, a writer I know called uh, David Gerard, an enormous Bitcoin skeptic. He's working on a book called The 50 Worst ICOs. And uh, this includes a, a proposal for um, transmuting uh, elements into one another on the blockchain. So it's so alchemy, essentially. It's, uh, 3,000 year old pseudoscience, but on the blockchain. Again, well, of course, if it's it, on the blockchain, then it's it's got to be, you know, it's got to right, be legit. Right, exactly. Just X on the blockchain. That's your, uh, that, that was how you raised money back in 2018. Yeah. But but the other point that I think you mentioned was that, um, you know, some of these bubbles have systemic, um, have a systemic consequences when they collapse. Others are, are fairly isolated. Um, so, um when we think about the dot com bubble, uh, you know, stock market crashed, collapsed, but it, it didn't really lead to a general recession in any way. Whereas the the collapse of the housing bubble in two thousand eight uh, really did. And, and I remember when Hank Paulson came to Berkeley, and this is right around the time when Bear Stearns collapsed. He 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 said to, he said, oh well, you know, subprime is 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 such a is such a um, isolated segment of the market. And that there won't be any spillover effects, and we'll be able to kind of, you know, contain it the way you know the Venetians would just put the people with the plague on the boat out in, the, in the harbor, and and we wouldn't really have to have to worry about it. Um, but the 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 spillover effects turned out to be, quite quite enormous. Um, I was wondering if you were you able to kind of develop any kind of theory about when these these things become systemic, and and I'm I'm thinking in particular about you know we're seeing Bitcoin now at Thirty-five thousand, you know, dollars. Uh, if if this if this price were to to collapse, um, you know, would it would it just be a bunch of uh, uh, cab drivers and and you know, uh, I think in in the you mentioned in the, in the eighteen uh, twenties when there was all sorts of concern that you had women and clergymen investing in stocks. So so that that means it's got it's got to be a bubble. And I remember when when Bitcoin was at. Um, it was at like uh, uh, twelve thousand back in two thousand eighteen, and and I had an Uber driver who was telling me all about all the different coins I needed to buy. So I was like, all right, that that that's a that's a bad sign right there. Um, but but you know the the collapse of the first Bitcoin bubble didn't lead to any kind of spillovers, right? It's kind of like a Beanie Baby sort of speculation. Um, how how were you able to figure out exactly you know what what when when is it when do these linkages turn out to be be significant? 
Yeah, so I, I think the key variable is debt. Um, to what extent are these assets, the bubble assets, being bought with borrowed money? Mm-hmm. Um, and when they're uh, bought by borrowed money, uh, is there going to be a chain of defaults uh, in the case of a crash? Um, now, you, you can have quite a minor chain of defaults. So, um, say uh, an internet company during the dot-com bubble goes burst, it is going to have some effects. Mm-hmm. It's going to default in some obligations to someone uh, that are going to cause a contraction in economic activity. But it's not major. The sort of major uh, focal point, as we're all very much aware, is the banks, financial institutions. Mm-hmm. Uh, and really what what I... Uh, I can't speak for Hank Paulson, but but I've read an interview with Ben Bernanke, and the what he missed was the insurance industry, mm-hmm. was the failure of AIG. We saw Lehman coming, and he, he had a good idea of what was happening with the other banks, but the uh, amount of uh, liabilities that AIG ha- had taken on in insuring these assets uh, was something that he just wasn't prepared for at all. And that was the the, the, the the pressure point. This was the um, point in the 2008 crisis when uh, you realized like this is uh, um, this is going to be serious. Um, I, I mean, the other uh, I'd say that the 2000s housing bubble had the worst economic consequences um, of any bubble in history, apart from potentially the Australian land boom. And the thing about the Australian land boom is that it's exactly the same thing, but 100 years earlier. You have um, this large shadow banking industry completely unregulated. You have the the recent removal of um, regulations by politicians who were uh, heavily invested in these banks and who were very much involved in the land boom. Uh, You you had a a housing boom, which uh, involved uh, a lot of... Um, small uh, property developers who were essentially not adding much value, just buying land and subdividing it and repackaging it and selling it on for a higher price. And then you had a crash, and this just brings down the entire financial system and uh, plunged Australia into one of the worst recessions in a in a developed country ever. Um, so... Um, they, they, these are your really bad bubbles. Yeah. Um, the bubbles that aren't so bad, you know, maybe uh, it, it's an asset that um, has no connection to the real economy, something like tulips or be- beanie babies. Um, it could be that the people who are buying the asset aren't doing it with borrowed money. They're just buying with their own money and then they're losing that money, but it's not having uh, knock-on effects. And it, to answer your final question about Bitcoin, it's not institutionally important. Um, Bitcoiners will tell you that institutions are investing in Bitcoin, but they're not. So I I think we're we're pretty safe in the event of a crash. Right. And um, I think you also mentioned that um, the cultural significance of the asset matters. So it's not just the financial interconnectivity, but, you know, when the stock market was something that was sort of on the front page every newspaper back in the, in the 1920s. And, and so even if, if people didn't hold stocks, they, they, they at least psychologically saw the collapse in the stock market as something which, which was a bad omen and and forced them to kind of spend less. Um, Yeah. So, so this has been a bit of a puzzle in economic history. Um, In popular culture and, you know, outside of economic history departments, People think of the Wall Street crash as the start of the Great Depression, mm-hmm. um, but it wasn't. Um, the, the, the Wall Street crash happens, and then in early 1930, uh, the economy starts to recover a little bit, uh, and businesses become quite confident that uh, the worst is over. And then at the end of 30, things suddenly get much worse. Um, so, so economists have looked at this and decided... Um, the, the the Wall Street crash probably didn't cause the depression, um, and the reason for this is that it's not causing bank failures. So what what actually one of the reasons that you get the crash is that 
margin lenders are become incredibly unscrupulous. They're just demanding the money back immediately. Mm -hmm. And because they do that, they don't fail. So these pe people who were actually exposed to the Wall Street crash, and they may not even have been particularly significant, but in any case, they're not losing much money. Uh, the companies uh, aren't failing a result of the Wall Street crash. They, they, it's a correction from their point of view. Uh, and the investors who are losing money are still a very, very small proportion of the population. If they cut back their spending, it's not going to have systemic effects either. So economists look at this and think the Wall Street crash couldn't have caused the depression. Um, one of the things that we uh, argue in the book, and something really that, that Robert Schiller has argued as well, is that it's not about these real economic connections. It's about the narrative. It's this narrative that we have of the 1920s in the US where everything was good. Um, you, you know, it, the economies were growing. Everyone was happy, the roaring 20s. And then suddenly everything went wrong and, and uh, we had to in endure a hangover uh, as a result of this overextension. And the moment it went wrong was the Wall Street crash. Um, what Robert Schiller points out is that that narrative was around at the time. Um, and he, so he points to uh, church sermons that followed the Wall Street crash uh, and shows that they were all uh, pushing this narrative, this idea of you know, excess is bad. Everyone needs to stop spending so much. Uh, everyone needs to rein it back in and sober up. And as a result of that, you, you may this may explain this um, drop in consumer spending, which had uh, no obvious economic cause in the data, uh, but was responsible for sparking off this chain of bank failures uh, that was the Great Depression. Yeah, I think you mentioned also the role of the media um, in the fourth estate, I think in your, in your concluding chapter, which, um, and I remember during the dot-com bubble, there, were, there must have been, uh, I don't know, a dozen new periodicals that came out and, and, and people started subscribing to something called the industry standard and, you know, wired and all these, these publications that were kind of breathlessly and, and feverishly covering, uh, all the, the new technology. Um, and so it really kind of, it wasn't just that there was this, new technology but then this new technology everyone was 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 thinking about it, everybody was talking about it everybody was was aware of it and that's one of the sparks you you mentioned that you know once you have the conditions in place right in the fire triangle you need, you need a spark and and you say that both politics and technology can 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 provide the 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 spark um what what kinds of common features do you, do you see in these in these in these sparks and and how would one kind of identify whether or not something is is one of these uh, potential sparks yeah it's a good question and, that, and this is the hard part so what we, what we can say is we look at the three sides of the bubble triangle so is there a lot of money and credit and right now there is is there a lot of marketability is marketability increasing and right now it is and is there a lot of speculation and right now there is so we, we say that you know these conditions are in place so it's likely that we're going to get a lot of bubbles in the near future. Um, and recently we have. But the difficult part is identifying the sparks. As you say, what is the bubble going to be in? And, um, you know, these can be either technological or political. I, I think technological is a little bit easier to spot um, because everyone will be talking about it uh, and it will have a very exciting story connected to it uh, yeah, one so, thing that i didn't i didn't i didn't really uh, think about was the the role of electricity in the 1920s and, and kind of how that was that really created a spark <laughs> excuse the pun right but that was yeah. that was sort of something that that you know people were super excited about yeah definitely I, I, electricity you know, mass production um yeah i, I mean um Tom Nicholas has a study on um, innovative firms during the um, 1920s and finds that they were um, you know, finding it much easier to raise capital and that this was justified, that they were also performing really well. Um, I, I, so the 1920s was just one of the most remarkable eras of growth uh, in US economic history. And 
partly driven by these new technologies. So you, you have electricity and you also have um, like refrigeration technology, uh, food processing, mass production, famously. Um, and, and this is causing this economic growth. And with economic growth, you have um, more money uh, available for people to invest in stocks. And you also get a certain level of excitement. Um, and one of the things that's might be a little bit forgotten is that 1920s was the peak of modernism. This idea that we're in a new world now and um, science is going to uh, solve a lot of our problems. And this is just one step removed from, uh, you know, sure that the company isn't making any money, but the old rules don't apply. We're in a new era. This new era narrative that Robert Schiller uh, highlights. Um, which is then used as a way to uh, a way for people to talk themselves in to invest in stocks that uh, don't look particularly like good investments. And you're coming out of a pandemic as well, right? <laughs> I mean, a real serious pandemic yeah. in 1918. So, you know, one of the other chapters that you uh, wrote about is, is China, and um, you know, it's it's a little bit different, right? I mean, the story's story's a different one. It's uh, kind of a story of financial repression and kind of res really restrictions on what people can and, and cannot invest in. Uh, and I've always been puzzled by China because it seems like it's, it's, a, it's, you know, in a perpetual bubble, right? I mean, you, you highlight kind of these two, two peaks, but um, I, I, as far as I can remember, I, I can't remember a time when people weren't saying that, for instance, Chinese, you know, real estate is, is in a bubble, right? I think in, in Hong Kong, you have to, you know, you need like, the rent is three times your annual income or so, you know, the, 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 the numbers are crazy. I don't have them at my fingertips, but, but the, um, uh, you know, real estate in particular is, is just so, uh, uh, has, has risen, risen so enormously and is so crazy expensive in so many, so many areas. I'm wondering if you could just say a few things about, uh, what, what China looks like to you and what, what, how you make sense of what's happening in China. Well, China is a heavily controlled market. You know, everything in China is heavily controlled. I, I think uh, in the West, we sometimes get this idea that um, whenever prices are kept artificially high through some kind of political means, that automatically means that those prices are unsustainable, that it's just destiny, that at some point they'll have to come crashing back to earth. That might be the case, but it's not necessarily the case. Uh, the Chinese government is very powerful, and sometimes it feels this was the story of the 2015 bubble, was that the Chinese authorities tried to do everything to prevent it from crashing, but they couldn't. They just, um, a lot of what they did just made things worse. Um, but on the other hand, if you think about the aftermath of the 2008 crash, uh, a lot of people were saying the quantitative easing was just going to inflate this bubble that would just fall apart. And that isn't what happened. You know, I, I don't know what the stock market is going to do tomorrow, but as of today, 2008 looks like a pretty great time to have invested. Um, so I, I think all markets are political to some extent, and it's not enough to say that look. Like, these prices are being propped up by the government, therefore there's going to be a crash. You need to make the argument that that can't go on, uh, that this um, political interference isn't sustainable, uh, and that's why prices are going to fall. Yeah. But it's very difficult. Yeah, yeah. So I, I guess I'd, I'd like to, you know, kind of conclude by hearing your thoughts on kind of the future of, of economic history. Uh, what's... What's its place? Um, uh, how much do you think that people, practitioners, it's important for practitioners to understand history? I mean, we, we teach in the business school, we teach the case method. And so a lot of students are often frustrated, like, why are we reading these cases from 20 years ago, right? Why aren't we reading a case from a month ago, right? <laughs> you know, um, what, what can be learned from, um, from history? What, why, why is it important for people or is it important for people to to, to have an historical perspective, um, especially if they're if they're practitioners, say if you're an investor. Yeah, so there are a lot of reasons. Um, I obviously 
like rare event risk. So some things just don't happen very often. And if you're focused on the last 20 years, you might think they never happen. Uh, you might think, you know, if you hadn't lived through a financial crisis uh, in 2008, maybe you didn't think a financial crisis was possible. Um, one of the uh, aspects of history uh, that I'm finding more and more is that uh, when you study economic history, uh, you start challenging your um, unwritten assumptions. So it, say you invest in the stock market today. Um, you're used to this these markets where it's very easy to buy shares. It's very easy to sell shares. It's very easy to short sell shares. Um, stocks are very liquid. There's very good transparency requirements. So you, you generally have a good idea of what you're investing in. And you can make the mistake of assuming that that's just what markets are like. But when you look at history and you look at where these markets came from and uh, what we had to go through to get to the point where markets were like this, you're able to see more of the mechanics underlying the, yeah. these systems. Um, and I think that helps you to make better decisions. Yeah, I mean, I, I used to teach financial history and I used to think of it not as a history course, but really a, um, you know, studying uh, less than perfectly liquid markets, right? Or less than... You know, studying markets that don't seem to conform to the the narrative of efficient markets. That that was sort of how I I approached it. And so um, we would go from studying uh, 18th century to studying, you know, uh, the unbanked in the 1990s, so to speak. So it's, it's very very similar. Um, and uh, and do you think that it, it's 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 really more important for, I mean, we talked about why it's important for practitioners to understand a bit of history. Do you think it, how important is it for historians to kind of understand um, the, the economics and, and finance? Um, I, I sometimes find that, that historians uh, are, are, you know, can be great storytellers, but oftentimes the, uh, the, the model that sits beneath the story is, is hasn't, hasn't been fully fleshed out. Yeah, I would agree with that a lot. Um, I mean, I, I love historians, I love history, uh, and I love history books. Uh, what I think they could take from economics is the rigor and formal reasoning. So um, for an economist to say that one thing caused something else, uh, they will need to set out uh, a counterfactual. So what would have happened if you know, the first thing hadn't happened uh, and show that th this is a good counterfactual, that it's a sensible counterfactual. Um, and then they'll often uh, run some kind of a test which eliminates alternative possibilities um, for the cause of this, this, this event um, and um, maybe approach it from both a qualitative and a quantitative angle, uh, just trying to um, really make sure that when you say something caused something else, what do you mean exactly? Mm -hmm. um, and make sure that, you're, uh, that, that what you're saying is accurate. Occasionally, uh, historians can be a bit looser with this, which is sometimes necessary. Sometimes you just mm -hmm. don't have the data or, or you don't have the information or the sources to show something was definitely true. You just have to you know, say it was true and uh, think on the, on the balance of probabilities. Uh, it probably was true, um, but I I do think this is something that history could take from economics. Definitely, is this um, you know, just holding yourself to, to a high standard of reasoning? Just make sure that um, when when you say something, you've done the best possible job that you can of showing that it's true. Yeah. So last last concluding, uh, you have any investment advice for us? Should we should be looking at um, you know Tesla? <laughs> what do you, you have any? Um, so I, I'm not really an, an investor. I don't know what prices are going to do next. Um, but I will say that I wouldn't be buying Tesla. So um, I, I think this might be a good one to sit out. Okay. Well, uh, William, thank you so much for uh, for coming in again. This is the the book uh, Boom and Bust. Um, Definitely, if you're if you're interested in financial history, or even if you're just interested in kind of what uh, what goes on in markets, I, I recommend it. So, uh, so thanks so much, William. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Okay.
This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.